Hello and welcome to Say Hi to the Future, Ingenious Thinkers, a podcast aimed at highlighting the human side of ingenuity. My name is Ken Tenser, curator of Say Hi to the Future, helping leaders think differently in the face of uncertainty and ambiguity. Better thinking, better outcomes. With me today is Sebastian Gendron, co-founder and CEO of Transpod, an organization developing the next generation of affordable and sustainable ultra-high-speed transportation for a better connected and fossil-free society. Like this video if you enjoy our show and subscribe to our channel. Leave us a comment with who we should interview next. Thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the show. Sebastian, welcome to Say Hi to the Future. Thank you. So tell me, I mean, firstly, you have a lot of experience um, in global transportation. I mean, you have a master's in in aerospace engineering. Um, You've worked with leaders like Bombardier, Safran, Airbus Group. How how did that become a a passion of yours or, you know, a focal point of your career? Uh, Well, I always was uh, kind of interested by um, airplanes. Uh, So that's justify a bit the... uh, the, the first years of uh, my professional uh, uh, career, uh, but I was not a good fit, uh, or I don't consider myself as a good fit uh, for those big corporations. And uh, and I think there is a an advice, not an advice, but something I've been following is that if you want to start a company, it's better to um, to do it in the field where you have a bit of expertise. Uh, and to yeah to remain in that same um, same field and uh, that tube transportation concept we're working on at Transport right now is literally an aircraft without wings so it's not really far from what I used to do uh, yeah there's actually way more it's actually even closer to a spacecraft than an aircraft so uh, even if it's travel at ground level it's um, yeah it's it's within my understanding, I would say. <laughs> so when you say that, that's interesting, because obviously we're becoming um, more attuned to, um, I mean, you have the, the Transpod, the or the Hyperloop, the what, there's, there's just a whole different bunch of introductions into that high speed transportation at ground level. I've never heard it called or likened to a spacecraft or an aircraft. How so? Yeah, it's actually uh, the almost the most obvious uh, thinking you may have when you you look at that. And it, you're right. I mean, people don't don't look at that. They they most of the time compare that to a high nice speed train or, mm-hmm. and, but not to, not to a spacecraft. Uh, just in few words about the um, the concept. It's been around for many years, and uh, like many years and popularized recently by Musk in 2012 or 2013. And uh, he changed the name, wanted to call it, uh, <laughs> he thought that tube transportation was not sexy enough. So mm-hmm. let's call it uh, Hyperloop to have a bit of hype be behind that. Uh, but the um, basically it consists of having uh, vehicles the size uh, of a train coach or a bus uh, traveling in a low pressure tube. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is where the spacecraft analogy comes in meaning that a low pressure tube, uh, we're dealing with pressure around 100 Pascal. Uh, so it's like similar pressure levels that if you're flying at uh, 50,000 feet, okay? Or 50, no, actually it's more than that. It's uh, if you're flying at 50 kilometers uh, above. Uh, above uh, so it's, it's at the edge of space. Uh, mm-hmm. And so you need, uh, in order for passengers to breathe in the vehicle, you need a pressurized cabin like on an airplane, uh, but with uh, uh, higher tolerances than uh, than for an airplane because airplanes uh, fly at uh, um, 10 kilometers above ground, roughly 10 to 12. Uh, and we're talking about 50 kilometers uh, above ground, uh, like in terms of pressure level. This is where the requirements uh, will need, uh, uh, we're working on right now to develop our vehicle or uh, closer to those applied for uh, for spacecraft. Um, and to finish on that, the fact that you're removing 99% of the air in the tube, 
allows the the vehicle to, in theory, achieve speeds uh, up to 1,000 kilometers an hour. So you're looking at airplane speeds on the ground, yep. essentially. And how, how does this work? How does this fit into our transportation needs? Because, I mean, we, we have planes, we have boats, we've got high-speed trains or high-ish speed trains. Yep. Um, relative to what you're saying, where does it fit into the whole transportation ecosystem? It's an excellent question. And that's uh, one question we had at the beginning. And like, If you want to develop a new transportation mode, it has to be better than existing ones. If mm -hmm. it's not better, uh, let's fly, take the car, the train or the boat. Uh, no need to kind of uh, spend lots of energy in that. And um, and to make it better, uh, there is more than the speed. Um, it must be um, uh, easier to use in a way that um, that system will provide the frequency of the subway with the speed of the aircraft. So really, in terms of uh, customer experience, we want this system to remove all the stress uh, we have uh, when we travel, even if we're used to, we're always, I'd say, uh, running into situations where you're stuck in traffic and uh, you you uh, you're thinking about, oh, I may might miss my airplane, or and you don't want to go through all the, uh, I would say, painful process of the insurance, get reimbursed, rebooking the ticket anyway. Mm -hmm. So if you know that you'll have vehicles every two three minutes or two to five minutes, like a subway you're removing all of that. Then there's other benefits as well uh, in terms of environmental benefits. Uh, uh, the first one I have is, of course, it's fully electric. Uh, mm -hmm. and the goal is to power the line with uh, renewable energies, uh, nuclear included. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's pointless if you power that with uh, coral uh, plants. <laughs> it's kind mm -hmm. of a right. same point uh, here. Uh, but then in terms of noise, uh, the advantage we have is that uh, being in a low pressure environment is that sound doesn't propagate uh, well in a low pressure environment. If you cry in space, nobody will hear you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and uh, that's kind of the same uh, in the tube. Uh, so the amount of vibration and noise is really uh, way lower than an airplane or an, an high speed train. It's also protected from the uh, weather elements. So if you have a snowstorm like we have in Canada uh, yeah. or a uh, thunderstorm, whatever, uh, you protect it. It's a guided system. It's actually, when you look at that, it's safer than a train or uh, an airplane. And then um, the speed, I would say it's really uh, for a um, um, continent like uh, uh, like North America, Australia, and, and some lines in the Middle East. Uh, the uh, challenge uh, high-speed train have been facing in North America is that distances are um, uh, uh, bigger, greater than um, uh, what we have in Europe. And mm -hmm. uh, then the, um, the airplanes still have a significant advantage over uh, trains. Because even if you have a nice speed train at 300,000 or um, uh, traveling at uh, 200 kilometers an hour. If you have uh, 1,500 kilometers to do, <laughs> right. like Chicago, New York, for example, or yeah, Chicago, uh, uh, Montreal, um, yeah, many people will still uh, will prefer flying rather than taking the train. But if we have a transport system between those two cities, then this is where it kind of starts to be uh, quite interesting. And the last item, which is the most important, is um, the ability to make those lines profitable. Uh, in Europe, Europe made the choice to provide public service uh, with ISP train, uh, knowing that most of those lines won't be profitable. And when we started that, when you're developing radical innovation, uh, it's not uh, you can't afford to to lose money because <laughs> uh, you are dealing first with the uh, with the innovation risk and so uh, how how can we uh, address the financial uh, risk and uh, in our infrastructure we can mix uh, we can mix uh, freight and passengers uh, freight we're talking time sensitive freight so everything shipped by DHL FedEx Amazon not uh, heavy freight 
And uh, by mixing, uh, by being able to mix passengers and freight uh, in the tube, uh, then you have a way better business case than a nice speed train. So when you combine all of that, then that makes sense to, this is why we're convinced that this is the, the future of ground transportation. This system can bring um, uh, to people uh, what internet uh, brought to uh, information. So uh, uh, if we uh, dream a little bit uh, or get that vision, it's to get the uh, uh, subway map at the continent level. And uh, rather than having, uh, I don't know, two subway stations, subway station could be replaced by uh, uh, cities at the continent level. Anyway. That's okay. The... No, I it's Alex, thank you for that. That's, that's a fascinating look at it. So here's my question back to you, though, when, when I listen to it, and I, and I think I've had this, I, I, this is not a unique thought. I mean, you talk about the internet, but the internet, I don't see. Um, I don't need space. I don't need physical space. Where does this model work in terms of, because it does need physical space, track, track space. I don't know that runs yeah. on a track or above, but how does how does that come to be? So uh, definitely we have to. It's not well internet. There is a bit of infrastructure. You still have to install a fiber optics lines, right? Or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, nothing comparable to uh, what we do. Uh, for us, we um, we definitely need an infrastructure. You need to build those corridors uh, between those lines uh, between those cities. Uh, the uh, the corridor the 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 configuration by default is above ground. Uh, for a simple reason, uh, the uh, again to be better than existing mode and have in mind a high speed train, uh, we want to avoid uh, the uh, expropriation aspect uh, when it comes to uh, uh, land acquisition. Mm -hmm. uh, being above ground, uh, we we will allow uh, farmers to continue to operate their land. And we also will allow the wildlife to continue to do its life. And because of the low, uh, I would say, uh, uh, noise aspect, uh, yeah, we we aim for the wildlife not to be annoyed by uh, uh, our system. So, and uh, and depending on the geography, uh, you may have to um, uh, dig tunnels if you have the Rockies to cross or the Alps or whatever. Differently, yeah, you. You need to know also if you enter into a dense area, it might be uh, actually cheaper to be uh, underground uh, or at ground level. So we have all kind of uh, configuration, but by default for the line we're working right now in Alberta, or even if tomorrow we do Toronto, Montreal, uh, the, um, the objective is to be above ground to actually uh, have an easier path to cut deals with uh, landowners and uh, uh, having kind of a more uh, a business interaction with them rather than telling them, sorry guys, we have a line <laughs> going through your land. You'll have to mm -hmm. be exploited if you don't want to sell it. <laughs> anyway, so uh, and 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 those infrastructure will take time, uh, take time and money. But money, the good news is that um, there's lots of uh, capital uh, available right now, or even uh, I mean, it's been a few years now, but lots of capital. And uh, they're looking for infrastructure projects. Uh, so, um, uh, however, they're not giving blank check, <laughs> and we have to demonstrate. Uh, we have to demonstrate the uh, the business case, and this is where the mixed freight passengers can can definitely. Uh, uh, that's definitely our value proposition right now. So, one, I I really appreciate the thought that expropriation is not. Um, necessary not ne or not necessarily uh required i think i think that's a great uh, you know to, to coexist with with what is already there i think that's a uh, a good strong opportunity my my i guess so just building the business case so um is this is this for a government um has this become a public utility are these privately run networks so <clears throat> Uh, at the moment, um, those infrastructure are fully private. Uh, even if we we um, like to call them a, a public-private partnership, okay, mm -hmm. or like PPP project, uh, yeah. uh, as we know in in many other infrastructure, 
Uh, I'm, what I'm saying at the moment is because uh, we know that governments are uh, most of the time uh, risk adverse, uh, despite what they say every day. <laughs> they don't want to take a risk and because they use the argument, oh, we, we don't want to lose uh, taxpayer money, which we fully mm -hmm. understand. Uh, we uh, so the 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 relationship or the partnership we're trying to get with governments is more uh, helping us to um, execute the project, not to spend any money, but just to kind of work with us on the regulation, uh, uh, yeah, on the on the paperwork. Uh, in Alberta, for example, we need a, a confirmation that transport is part of the Railway Act, uh, and down the road, if if, it, if we're not part of the Railway Act, we may need the government to modify it. So this is the type mm -hmm. of relationship. And uh, we want also the governments to, um, uh, I think it's, it's. Um, and I should not say that, but uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm convinced that's the right way to do. Um, governments should have a, a, a say uh, in those infrastructure, meaning that even if they don't invest, uh, I encourage them to be uh, part of those entity executing those projects with some veto rights uh, to make sure that this transportation system doesn't uh, become a transportation system for rich people or if politically speaking, uh, there's a need to add a station uh, in, uh, we have the example with Red Deer in Alberta. Financially speaking, it doesn't make any sense to, uh, to add a station. Uh, but, but if we don't do it, uh, we're not helping the city to develop economically speaking. Mm -hmm. So we want the government to be involved in order to tell investors that, okay, if you want to execute, if you want to have the the big piece of the pie, you must have a station. Because if they don't do anything, if they let the, the private sector do whatever they want. So far, we still have the majority on those uh, on those projects so we can we can have a i would say a, a wise way of executing that uh, mm -hmm. but to we lose the majority on those projects uh, because we have to execute and and they have a different view on how to do it we may not have that except if the if governments uh, are involved uh, somehow so that's the um, so public private partnership yeah. nominee right now oh and to finish on that those infrastructure, and I understand that governments may be a bit skeptical at the beginning, they want to see first, but we're convinced that those infrastructure will generate revenue. Uh, so uh, for government's budget, it might be good to have some shares of those projects to uh, get some. <laughs> <laughs> so w when you look at this, and I mean, if you're in the air, you can book uh, a flight with Air Canada from one part of Canada to the other. You can book a flight from WestJet from one part of Canada to the other. What happens here? I mean, because there are other pod or Hyperloop or whatnot technologies that are being developed. I mean, if each province of each part of the province chooses a different technology, we don't have the benefit of running across the country like, like the Trans-Canada Highway, for instance. How do you see that business model opening up to actually be beneficial and not make us get off the pot every two hours and go to the next one? <laughs> That's a yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, it's actually a concern uh, Europe has. Uh, they talk a lot about uh, interoperability because they have the experience between the different European countries uh, of uh, trains not being compatible. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, and uh, even, yeah, the, the railway or the rail gauge and, and uh, whatever it's, they, it took, it's taking them some, some, you know, significant amount of time to kind of try to make it compatible. So they, Europe is pushing us to be, uh, to work on something common, uh, to be interoperable. To be specific on to your question in North America and, and what may happen next, there's two scenarios. Uh, the first one is that uh, several companies emerge and start to develop uh, infrastructure projects across the country and that interoperability will 
will probably have to be enforced by regulators. So that's one scenario. The second scenario is that the winners takes all. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that we have a chance today uh, to, um, first of all, Transport is the only company with a first infrastructure project in Alberta with some financing confirmed. I think we, uh, we have a one, if not the strongest uh, engineering strategy on how to develop the technology. Uh, we have a pretty good understanding on how to, uh, uh, to make it work and a pass forward. And there is a significant uh, investment coming in in the company. So as of today, uh, uh, we're working to uh, take the lead on that market uh, and uh, definitely uh, execute uh, the project in a, uh, in a way uh, which is way faster than our competitors. Mm. Uh, in North America, our two American competitors are losing pace in a, in a political way. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're working with in Texas as well. Uh, in addition to Alberta, we have some discussion as well about Toronto, Montreal and uh, Washington State and, and so on. So uh, the other competitors are in, uh, in Europe. And Europe, we for us, it's not a, a market because of the amount of uh, trains they already have. Right. So it's really North America, Australia, and uh, Middle East. I think we're well positioned right now. And uh, I would love if you could ask me the question in uh, six months uh, to confirm what I just uh, 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 told you. Uh, so the goal is really kind of to take the lead. Having said that, uh, there is one... Um, one country uh, which is actually uh, for, I see them uh, being our biggest competitor more than the other companies is uh, China. China is investing a lot in this technology uh, and uh, uh, to develop their, uh, their own technology uh, in a way. So one scenario, maybe that's the third one which may occur is having, um, let's say that we become the, the next kind of uh, transportation giant or ground transportation tech developing the network in North America. I won't be surprised that China uh, uh, will develop uh, his, his own version of it. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have like Airbus and Boeing, we'll have maybe two players uh, competing in that uh, in that market. So uh, anyway, that's uh, okay. one way. We'll see. <laughs> so, I mean, look, you mentioned Alberta. You mentioned why I, I did in the reading. Texas. I think you've got one in, in Limoges and in, in, in France. Um, so Limoges is, a, like Limoges is a test facility. Okay. Uh, so it's R&D. It's, it's not an infrastructure uh, project per se. Okay. When will I be able to uh, buy my first ticket for Alberta then? <laughs> so hopefully before uh, 2035. So that's the that's the plan. In terms of timeline, uh, we aim to kick off construction end of next year for that uh, test track uh, between the Edmonton Airport and the south end of the city. Then two years of construction, so uh, uh, to be so finished in 2027. Uh, then two years of testing, 2027, 2028, 2029, and then this will give us the green light. Uh, to build the full line. Uh, the full line, 200 kilometers, uh, if we're really good, could be done uh, like again, 20, uh, 2033. So that's why it's okay. Let's aim for before 2035. Yeah. That will be my retirement present to myself. I'm going to come out to Alberta. <laughs> yeah, it will. And, and But even before that, if we uh, only... Uh, by only starting the um, construction of the test track, uh, uh, hopefully next year, that would put Alberta and Canada on the map, definitely. Okay, well, uh, you know, as our time is, it's, it's come to a close here, uh, Sebastian, Sebastian Gendron of Transpod. Uh, thank you so much and, you know, for your time today. And just, you know, one, one final question, because it's been a fascinating uh, 30 minutes. Hyperloop technology, I mean, is it really the future of, of you know, transportation and mid, 
mid-haul transportation, I might say. To maybe clarification, Hyperloop is not, it's like a, if we were talking about car technology, so mm -hmm. it's not, there's no uh, tech per se uh, behind uh, uh, the word Hyperloop. Uh, okay. We're looking at, uh, yeah, we're trying to differentiate ourselves from that word. You know, it's like a Kleenex or Kodak. Mm -hmm. It was nice that uh, Musk uh, uh, kind of put that name uh, out there, but now it's kind of sticking uh, in our back. <laughs> so we said, okay, let's get rid of it. We may actually run a, a marketing campaign uh, similar to what Macintosh did uh, uh, in the uh, 19s, uh, 90s to... Um, uh, to uh, differentiate themselves from uh, Microsoft, <laughs> from personal computer. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, uh, but to answer your question, yeah, that's the future. Uh, High-speed train, um, uh, they reach out, they reach a physical limit. Uh, they go, they can't go beyond 300 kilometers an hour. They do some tests time to time to 500, but operationally speaking, uh, they're limited to uh, uh, to 300. And uh, uh, from a business case uh, standpoint. Uh, we've seen that in Europe, 80% of those ISP drain lines are not profitable, so it's not sustainable. So we need to rethink the way we travel and uh, cars are nice, uh, but it's, I don't see that being the, uh, it's not like uh, not being the future, but we, uh, we have to uh, diversify. We need to have other modes of transportation. Airplanes will continue to evolve with hydrogen and other type of uh, uh, fuel. Uh, meanwhile, as the population grow, we'll have uh, other needs and tube transportation are, we see them, we see that as being the future uh, for all the reasons we've discussed. Um, low noise level, 100% uh, electric, uh, easier to use, uh, faster, uh more environmentally friendly so that's okay that's we have a way to connect cities in a way more efficient way than what we have today so uh we need to uh get it done okay well we look forward to it earlier you said you know ask you again in six months we we often do uh checkbacks so if you have something that you want to update us with uh reach out to sonia we love to do quick updates uh on our podcast and on our social media to keep uh engaged with our say hi to the future thing no definitely on one one topic for uh, in in six months is uh how uh, uh innovation is being financed uh nowadays love to chat about that one so again <laughs> sebastian thank you so much thank you for talking about transpot and we'll we'll speak again excellent thank you very much